Hi everyone, and welcome back to The Shack. And in this episode, something no doubt particularly special to those of us that are of a certain age and who were at school in the UK in the 1980s, but hopefully of interest to everyone, as this machine sparked the fires of imagination for students in the UK, the BBC Micro. In 1978, it was clear that the UK was underprepared for the coming computer revolution. Across the world, businesses were embracing the silicon chip and changing their ways of working and thinking. Also that year, a UK TV show called Horizon aired a special called Now the Chips Are Down, which highlighted the lack of action by the government to address what was being called the microelectronics revolution. Horizon called into debate whether the UK was prepared for the impact of computers on all our lives, jobs and ultimately the UK's future as a global power. By 1980, it was recognised by both the British Broadcasting Corporation and the government that something needed to be done to engage young people with the emerging microcomputer market and therefore prepare a generation with knowledge and skills that would allow the UK to compete with the likes of Japan and the US who at that time were deemed to be leaving the UK far behind. Born out of this recognition was the Computer Literacy Project, which launched in 1982 and ran through to 1989. But in order to have a computer literacy programme, there needed to be some way of ensuring a consistent approach and reliable access to the technology. The BBC had already been approached by the government to determine how they could assist, and the idea was born of a government-backed and BBC endorsed standard microcomputer that would be used in TV shows supporting the project and that students could engage with in schools as part of the national curriculum. So the BBC engineering department set about in search of a computer that would fit the bill. If you want to learn more about that process of choosing which computer eventually got to bear the name BBC Micro, I would recommend watching Micromen a 2009 Channel 4 TV movie which covers the major rivalry between the two main competitors at that time, Acorn and Sinclair. And 40-year-old spoiler alert, Acorn won, and the BBC Micro was officially born. And what a machine it was, and still is. As we go through our maintenance and refurbishment of this machine, we'll also learn a little about just what made it special, and why to this day, so many people have so much love in their heart for the Beeb. Well, for one, it was built to endure. The keyboard is solid with a nice responsive action, and the case is a firm textured plastic, which in our case is showing the signs of 40 years of use. The rear of the machine has connectors for UHF and video out, RGB, RS423, a cassette recorder, an analog in port, an Econet port, and a sturdy on-off switch. And the power cable couldn't be detached. Underneath the machine we have connectors for tube, a 1 MHz bus, a user port, printer, disk drive and an auxiliary power output. We'll go through all of these ports and their uses a little later. To really understand why the BBC Micro endures, to this day we have to take a look inside. And to do so we need to first remove these four screws. This model is the Model B with 32K of memory, although there was also a cheaper Model A with 16K of memory and a few less features. The Model A could be upgraded to the same spec as a Model B, but to do so fully required a little soldering. While mostly the machine was very friendly to the hobbyist, like the keyboard being held in with these simple nuts and bolts, taking a hot iron to your new machine didn't really appeal to most. Perhaps due to this, and with the government subsidies for schools reaching as high as 50% discount, most people opted for the Model B out of the gate. To remove the keyboard, we need to carefully detach this ribbon cable. It's not very flexible, so be careful not to damage it by pulling too hard. Finally, before pulling the keyboard away, there's a small power cable to remove. It's a good idea to take pictures of these cables beforehand, so you know how to refit them correctly. And with the keyboard removed, we can see that whilst the plastic is in good shape, a darn good clean is in order. Let's remove all the power cables that run from the power supply to the main board. Again, a picture beforehand will really help here when plugging these back in. 
I've noticed already that there is a large proportion of the mainboard that contains unpopulated sockets. So let's take a look at the motherboard in more detail and see if we can discover what's missing and why. Let's start with the chips we do have. First and foremost, the 6502A CPU clocked at 2 MHz as standard, but dropping to 1 MHz when addressing certain slow devices such as the ADCs and the VIA chips. Next up is the 6845 CRT controller, which provides most of the BBC's video circuitry required to drive the CRT monitor. This chip will also read the input from a light pen if fitted. Teletext modes are handled via a separate chip, which is why there are no graphics modes that allow teletext and pixel graphics on the same screen. IC69 holds the first of the VIA or Versatile Interface Adapter chips. This one responsible for two ports. Port A is used to provide a Centronics standard parallel printer interface, port B for the user port. The second VIA at IC3 handles all manner of things, including the keyboard, the sound generator and speech system chips. It also handles the caps lock and shift lock LEDs on the keyboard and the two fire buttons on the joysticks. Our 32K of memory sits over here. Our OS ROM and BASIC ROM occupy two of the five ROM sockets in the bottom right of the motherboard. So what about all those empty sockets? Well, IC78 would contain our floppy disk controller, if we had a floppy disk, which we don't at this time. IC98 and 99 would need to be populated for synthesized speech to be available. All of these are required to enable Econet networking. And finally, all of these would need to be filled up for the disk filing system, or DFS, to be available. I'm going to try and find all of these chips in order that this machine is up to its maximum spec, and I'll cover that in future episodes. So let's finish our strip down by removing the mainboard and the power supply. There are five screws that hold the mainboard to the lower case, and as always, be careful as the plastic is old and it's easy to strip the threads. Once all of these screws are removed, there's the little matter of that need for a soldering iron again, as the video out connector is soldered directly to the main board. It's only a couple of wires, so a dab of heat here and there, and it's easy to disconnect. Take photos again, so you know how to reconnect it later. With those wires disconnected, the main board simply lifts free, leaving a somewhat dirty case behind. And the power supply is held in with these three screws on the bottom of the case. Be careful with this as unless supported the power supply will drop out when the last screw is removed. Not good for your toes. The power supply can now be removed along with the power cable which on this particular unit seems very long indeed. And at the end, there's a puzzle. How to get an oddly shaped UK plug through a hole that appears too small. Enjoy my struggle. Simple. So that about wraps up part one. In the next episode, we'll give the old girl a good clean, getting into all the nooks and crannies. We'll be recapping that old power supply with some lovely new capacitors and we'll fit a simple SD card solution to make up for our lack of disk drives in cassette recorder and also because it's quite cool. We'll then finally boot her up and make sure all is well. In the meantime, I'm going to look out for all the missing bits that we need to fully load this little old beeb. I hope you've enjoyed the episode. If so, please subscribe and hit the bell to be notified of new content. And please leave your comments, suggestions and ideas below. Until next time in the shack, goodbye.